Hey everybody, Bob Babbitt here, Challenged Athletes Live. So excited to have two awesome people with us today. We've got paratriathlete Mary Kate Callahan and we're from Strava, the executive chairman and co-founder, Mr. Mark Ganey. How are both of you guys doing? Good. Happy Friday. It's happy Friday. Um, doing good. Love it. So, so Mary Kate, let's go back. Uh, how how did you end up in a wheelchair and how long was it before you found sports after ending up in a chair? Um, so I say I've been in a wheelchair my entire life, but I had a virus that went to my spinal cord at the age of five and a half months old. Um, that left me a paraplegic. Um, so, you know, life in a wheelchair is what I was used to. I thought everyone rolled around on a purple sparkly wheelchair. Um, you know, that was my normal if there is such thing, but, um, you know, my parents wanted me out there with my friends, with my family, with my cousins doing everything they were doing and um, a huge part of my family's life growing up and I had two older brothers and a ton of cousins was sports. Um, and, you know, I loved the water. Um, so swimming was kind of the first adaptive sport that I got into um, at the age of six, joined my first swim team, um, was the only person with a disability on the swim team. Um, but that, that didn't, I didn't care. I was there because I wanted to be with my friends. I wanted that community. Um, I wanted to be able to go back to school at lunch and recess and, you know, talk about that super hard practice or that super hard, uh, swim meet. And, you know, I was competing against, I was competing with other athletes, but, um, at the end of the day, I was pushing myself. Um, you know, maybe my hand wasn't on the wall first. Um, but I was trying to beat my time every, every race. And, um, you know, one thing kind of led to another and 25 years later racing in the sport of triathlon, but, um, you know, sport has developed me into the person I am today, both on the course and out off the course. So, um, it's a large part of my identity as a, as a, as a human. How did you get involved with CAF? Yeah. Um, so I, like I said, I joined a swim team, able-bodied swim team at the age of six and, you know, was really only swimming against, um, people who didn't have a disability. And at a certain point I wanted to know what competition was like, you know, maybe competing against someone else in a wheelchair. Um, you know, so started looking around in terms of what other communities exist, like in the adaptive sport world. Um, I grew up in Chicago. I still live in Chicago. So there was definitely, um, you know, a presence in the Chicagoland area. Um, and then someone told me about CAF and um, was just blown away at the community that they introduced me to. And um, you'll probably hear the word community thrown out multiple times during this, but that's why I'm still involved in the, in sport, you know, despite the races and podiums and everything else. Like I care about the people that I get to race with and get to hang out with and get to um, look up to, and now hopefully mentor as well. And so um, the community that CAF introduced me to is something I will forever cherish. Um, and, you know, want to continue to be able to give back to that community as well as I get older and, um, and yeah, so thank, well, thank you CAF. <laughs> hey, so Mark, talk a little bit about uh, creating Strava, and I love reading about your background. You were a you know, cross-country runner, a state champion, and then you go to Harvard and end up injured and can't, with a stress fracture, can't run, so you go to a rowing team, and that pretty much changed your life, right? You meet someone there, and next thing you know, you guys have been buddies and partners for, since then. Yeah. Yeah, Bob, that, that's exactly right. It's, uh, it's funny how fate has a uh, special way of playing an important role, right, in, in one's life. And uh, yeah, sport's been part of my life for a very long time uh, with the running and soccer as a kid. And then you're right, got to, uh, got to college and, and made the transition to crew where it's really important for two reasons. One, it's where I did meet my co-founder, uh, Michael Horvath, and we became the best of friends and you know, have worked together now for almost 30 years. But it's also the place where, similar to what Mary Kate described, it's where we really found community and team and just the camaraderie that comes from participating in sport together. And the only problem was we graduated and, you know, poof, it, it disappeared. And uh, we literally have a business plan that dates all the way back to 1995 that was basically a first version of Strava. It was how do we take this internet thing and try to create a virtual locker room for all of our friends? How do we, how do we leverage that? that opportunity to bring people back together because we just, we realized that um, 
staying motivated to be active is it's hard. It's uh, and yet it's so important. Like the the beauty of being active is just the impact it has, you know, across your life, whether it's physical, emotional. Yeah, I'm a better parent. I'm a better coworker. There's just so many great things that come once you're doing it. But it doesn't mean it's easy. And we really came to appreciate that it's people who keep people active. And so that's that's really the genesis of Strava is how do we connect athletes to each other so that we can we can help each other, you know, achieve achieve our dreams. So when did you connect with Challenge Athletes Foundation and in terms of meeting some of our athletes and realizing, hey, these athletes need something at Strava that maybe we don't have at this point. Yeah. Yeah, we were first turned on to see if at least I was back in 2014. Uh, Strava was fortunate enough to actually do a challenge. Uh, it was Challenge Athletes Foundation, Goo, and yes. Strava came together uh, to raise some awareness and to raise some funds. And that for me was the first time where I was really introduced to the program and, and just the special opportunity. It, it, if you look at Strava today, we're this global community. You know, we've got 70 million people across lots of different geographies and backgrounds and so forth. And just sort of fun to see this this whole new community that I hadn't been aware of around the adaptive community. And yeah, I'm sitting here today with, you know, having had an arm surgery and I'm learning we're constantly adapting. Everybody's constantly adapting. And so to be introduced to that and become part of it and then work with amazing athletes like Mary Kate to really think about how we shape Strava to be more inclusive. Um, you know, we've got a long ways to go, but getting hand cycling in as, as one of the sports and so forth. So that was the introduction. What's so cool is with the, with the CAF and Strava Challenge right now, what, 163,000 people are registered and our, our CAF club on Strava has over 3,300 members now. Yeah, no, it's great. And I think we're two days away. I, we'll get, we'll, I'll bet we'll see 200,000 people on this challenge before we're done. So I'm really excited. That is so cool. Uh, and when you, uh, obviously athletes from so many different sports, what did you learn about wheelchairs and how they could be part of this through Mary Kate and some of the other athletes? Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing I learned is uh, don't ever underestimate the, the strength, condition, and, and just resilience of, of any athlete. I think that's the beauty of this is that we're all sort of of one community uh, and go through the same challenges and motivations and, and inspiration. Uh, it's the great sort of common bond. It's why I love even the motto of, of CAF, right? Uh, you know, empowering lives through sport. It's, it's exactly it. So I think the first thing is that there's far more common bonds than there are differences. Um, now, there are some unique things in terms of making sure that we, you, you got to learn like what's the most important data uh, for somebody who's who's competing in a wheelchair. Uh, how do we make sure that the, the playing field is is fair, and and that there's high integrity there? Uh, you get our athletes are they pay attention to the data and to the details and so forth. So just making sure that we were creating an experience that was authentic uh, was important. So Mary Kate, one of the things that we had the first ever para triathlon, Paralympic para triathlon in 2016. At that time, in terms of this country, you were the top, right? You were one of the best in, in the world. And randomly, they decide what categories you're going to have for the Paralympics and, and para triathlon. They're like, oh, we won't have women in wheelchairs and we won't have blind guys. It's randomly. So, how did that change things for you? Because you were on path to go to Rio. Yeah, so I started racing about five years or six years prior to the Rio Games. And obviously for a long time, you know, paratriathlon was announced as a new sport. Everyone was super excited. Um, and then we were kind of told two years prior to Rio that the women's wheelchair classification um, was not going to be a medal event. Um, so obviously that changed my course of, you know, what are my goals in the sport? And I loved the sport and the community for what it was, um, despite no matter what the finish line was, whether it was a, a local race or the Rio games or a, a world cup, like the sport had a huge heart, part of my heart. Um, and I wasn't going to let the fact that we weren't going to have the ability to race in the Rio games push me away from the sport. I knew that that immediately after that was announced immediately after that email came out. And while it was a little bit of a heartbreak, you know, you, you pick up the pieces and you say, what am I going to do next? Um, and so that's when I decided to embark on my Ironman journey. Um, and it was one of the most amazing journeys ever. And I think um, looking back, 
now, um, almost four or five years later, um, it's one of my favorite finish lines um, because the journey to train for an Ironman, it isn't easy. It's a long journey, um, but it's so rewarding. And again, bringing back community, like the actual Ironman race, it's the best. It is literally the best day ever. I mean, you are, you feel like your best friends with all the competitors out there. Everyone has their own why as in terms of why they, they decided to embark on this crazy journey, but you're all in it together. And, um, I have definitely the itch to do another Ironman, uh, after this Tokyo journey wraps up, but, um, it's, it, it's so hard to put it into words, but that finish line hearing like you are an Ironman, it's way more than just that day. It was every single mile that added up into that, to that finish line. What I love, and I think both of you guys symbolize this, right? What Ironman and all of our sports represent is they're equal opportunity abusers. They don't care if you're in a wheelchair. They don't care if you're missing a leg. They don't care if you're blind. Get out there, get from point A to point B, and that's all that matters. Mark, for you, you obviously coming from a running and a rowing and, and all of this background, when did it click to you that, okay, this Strava thing that we're starting is really catching on. All of a sudden, we're getting hundreds of thousands of people who are loving what we're doing. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Bob. It's, it's, I think part of this has been fun because it's been so organic. Uh, when Michael and I launched back in 2009, uh, we'd be the first to acknowledge our aspirations were, were fairly narrow in the sense that if it could keep the two of us active, that was a win. Like, it's like we, we needed something that served our needs and we could get our friends going and so forth. And, you know, we had some strategy along the way. We were, we were very focused early on on the cycling community, just trying to meet their needs. And uh, a couple things happened. I mean, part of it was just luck. You know, the advent of a mobile phone and sort of as a device that you could use to, to track just open up opportunity for people across the globe. Uh, and I think once we began to really understand that sports truly is universal and, and reaches across geographies seamlessly, we saw sort of growth that we just didn't anticipate and geographically and, and also across sports. You know, I love Mary Kate's story around just sort of the ability to transition from one activity to another. Very few of us are so narrow that we're only doing one sport all the time. And so with Strava, we quickly realized that our athletes weren't just cyclists, but they were running and they were doing some skiing or they were challenging themselves to a triathlon, whatever the case might be. And, and you know, you fast forward to today, you have 70 million athletes worldwide, 195 countries, uh, 30 different activities uh, on the platform. And I think most importantly, there's just always that common bond. It comes back to just sort of this one community that, that loves giving each other kudos, you know, virtual <laughs> high fives. Uh, Mary Kate, when did you start using Strava and how do you use it now? Uh, I'll answer the second question first. I use it every day, multiple hours of the day, I feel like. And I think, you know, now, especially being so virtual, like one of my favorite things to do is, you know, wake up in the morning and see what teammates or what friends who live in other countries have already done. And there's nothing more motivating than seeing someone else complete, whether it was a tough workout or they hit all their, their intervals. Like, they completed their workout. And so that's what motivates me to, as I get up to do my first workout for the day. So I use it all the time. I, I like to call myself a Strava nerd. Um, but um, I started using it in college. So around 2013 in my freshman year of college. Um, and as I, you know, started racing around the globe and stuff, I feel like I just saw more and more a use case for it um, and meeting people and athletes from all over who are doing all different activities. You know, some of them are hikers or ultra marathoners or purely just cyclists. And like at the end of the day, we all are moving our bodies for a reason and enjoy that. And that, like you said, Mark, that's our common bond. And um, no matter what, how, or why you're doing it, um, that unites us. And I think the I call it like the power of people. Like there's nothing more powerful than seeing people accomplishing goals or starting to try to accomplish goals. I, you know, I think the finish line is so important, but there's a reason everyone gets to that finish line. And I think there's more importance of like how people started, why they started, how they started, um, who do they start with? And I think, you know, Strava kind of wraps that all together and um, really shows that journey from the start to the finish. Um, 
so so that's my Strava Strava history. <laughs> How has Strava adapted to adapt, adaptive athletes? Yeah, I mean, I think the activities themselves, adding the activities to allow us to kind of show that we are adaptive athletes, it's educating all athletes on what people with disabilities can do. And that hand cycle activity um, is showing people that they're, we're riding our bikes, we're just riding it on a bike that looks a little different than you. Um, and I think the other feature that has rolled out is the ability to see, you know, routes. Um, I travel a lot, a lot and to places that I've never been before and the ability to see where other people are running and kind of what the terrain is and how it looks like that's how I know if I can, if something is a trail or a road um, and on a racing chair, like running on trail isn't the easiest thing. And so I want to find routes that are road based. Um, so I think in terms of, you know, other functionality that might not have rolled out specifically for adaptive athletes, we're also benefiting from and we're using it in a way that other athletes might not be using it. Um, so, you know, I think everything they're, everything Strava is doing is, you know, keeping all their athletes of all abilities from all around the world in mind um, as they continue to expand as a company. So I love it. So what's cool is the, the Strava challenge that we're going, doing right now, the 100 mile cycling challenge, uh, we're trying to get to $2 million through our community challenge presented by Vega that we're doing this 10 weeks. And then for two weeks, we're doing a 100 mile cycling challenge. And I'm just looking at the prizes. We're talking a Canyon Aero, Aero Road bike, which I know Mark wants, and last two pairs of Peter Sagan unlim ultra limited uh, edition glasses that are 24 karat gold uh, coated lenses. We got all sorts of stuff going on. Mark, for you, obviously giving back is important to you. Talk a little bit about how important that is because you're with Strava, you guys have helped a lot of different charities out and we really appreciate what you guys are doing for CAF. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it, it's an honor. It's, uh, and it's, it's easy. I think we all wish we could be doing more. Uh, you know, that it's, we try to figure out, um, uh, well, I'll say the a funny phrase. Michael and I learned long ago that we, we lost control of this business years ago. It, it's, it is owned by the community. It is the community. It's, and we're just trying to shepherd sort of the opportunities and how we can really work with the community to promote different things. And whether it's individual goals, the way Mary Kate was just describing and sort of helping someone achieve what it is that they want to go out and accomplish, or it's some of these broader initiatives. And I think here, there's just an awareness that we want to, we want to bring to the situation. Like, Again, sports are universal. Everybody should be able to do them, but they're also expensive. Like it's, it's you know, I don't even want to ask Mary Kate what it costs to, to, I mean, for her to go out and run is not as easy as me putting on a pair of shoes. Like there's, there is real equipment that's involved. And so I think we, we've got the kind of community who wants to support this, uh, but they just need greater awareness. And that's something that Strava can bring to the table. Um, and given that sort of, again, universality, the fact that this is a global opportunity, it just resonates really well with our group. I think what a lot of people don't realize is that insurance doesn't cover this, right? If you need a racing chair that's $3,000 or you need travel expenses to go to Paralympics, none of this stuff is covered. And that's, that's really where we come in through, through CAF. And we, we really, really appreciate all the support, Mark. You guys have been amazing. Going back to the, the GOO challenge with, with Strava and CF in, in 2014, we raised about like $60,000. And now our goal is we're hopefully going to get to $2 million. We started August 8th, going until October 18th. And our two-week two CAF uh, Strava challenge is going to be awesome. So, Mark, what, what, what are your go-to sports now? Well, it, it is really easy to put the running shoes on and still just head out the door and uh, uh, hit the trails. I'm fortunate enough to live here in Northern California where there's lots of good dirt and, and single track. Uh, mountain biking is also something that's near and dear to me. Uh, so, you know, those are the two easy go-to. I've got twin, twin boys who keep me really active. They're, they can, they're faster than me these days. So I just try to, you know, basically put a leash on them and, and let them drag me around. But that's it. That's, that it keeps it simple. I remember mountain biking one thing. is my next adventure. I want to give a go. So I might what have to that? ask you for some tips. You got it. it. Looks, I'm a thrill seeker and, um, you know, I ride a road bike, but mountain biking is my next, I think, calling to give it a go. I it's love that. Uh, Mark, I, I love the fact that I think out of high school, you had an option of going to Australia for the World Cup, for uh, America's Cup and watching Dennis Conner or 
getting a mountain bike. <laughs> and you took the mountain bike. That was probably one of the better decisions you ever made. Oh, Bob, you've done your homework. Yeah, you're, you're, digging, up some, you're digging up some gems. It's all true. It's true. My, my parents knew. It's, it's kind of funny. I'm, I'm realizing behind me, I've got, a, I've got a model of an America's Cup boat. I'm still a huge fan and, and love being on the water, but probably the more important is across my other shoulder. It's uh, cycling just kind of became part of my life as a kid. And uh, I will attest to the fact that uh, – it's it's not always been kind to me. I'm I'm pretty good at ending up in the hospital due to uh, <laughs> due to accidents and things. But I think that's what we learned too, right? It's it's part of the resilience, and you just it's all part of the journey. So I I keep getting on the saddle and trying to have some fun. Love it. You guys are awesome, Mark, Mary Kate. Thank you so much for taking time to come on Challenge Athletes Live. It's been a pleasure chatting with both of you guys. Thanks, well. Bob. Thank Thanks, you, Bob. Mark. Thank you. My name is Bob Babbitt. That is Challenged Athletes Live. Everybody, tune in next time. See ya.